All right, if you have your Bibles, we'd ask you to turn to the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 3, some fairly familiar verses of Scripture. Exodus chapter 3, and we're going to begin reading in the very first verse. Exodus chapter 3, in the first verse, the Bible says, Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight while the bush is not burned, is, is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, and the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people, which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your goodness and watch care to the church here in Dover. Lord, we pray that you would allow us to be strong and to be vigilant, to be faithful to your word in the day which we live. God, we pray for each and every person that is before us today, Lord, that you would wake them up to your will, that you would cause us to follow after your good, and we'd be faithful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it all. For it is in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Now, very familiar uh, verses of scripture and what I'll be preaching on this morning is the revealed person of God. Now there is not one truth in this blessed old book that you can ever capture without God really revealing it to you. Now you can read about it and you can hear it preached about but it, when it becomes a reality is when God reveals it to Amen. you and he reveals himself to you and you can rejoice in it. Yeah. Now notice in the first verse again, it says, Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law. Now, I want you to notice, and you will remember the history of Moses' life prior to this, that he was sustained by God in the house of the, uh, the princes of Egypt, and that his mother became his own nurse and nurtured him to health and uh, brought him along the way and no doubt taught him the truths uh, that they knew at that time. But I want you also to remember it was before the years of the law. That it was before the time that the law was given. And the last time the character and the nature of God was revealed was in the day of Joseph, and Joseph knew the plan of God was to sustain them. So the knowledge of God was limited in that day, uh, but I want you to see when he became an, uh, a grown man, he refused to be called the, the son of the Pharaoh's daughter. And, and so that seems good, but it did not mean he knew God. Uh, I don't think that Moses was saved until this occasion that we're reading about. I believe he was a religious person, but if he was a saved person, he would have had no he would have uh, had no business marrying the daughter of the priest of Midian. He was not a Jewish priest. That office had not even been developed yet. By the hand of God, the priest of Midian was an idolater. And he married his daughter, and not only did he marry his daughter, he was down there working for him. And so I want you to see that this Moses up to now was simply religious. And I'm fearful today in the modern day, everybody goes, what's wrong with the day that we live in? What's wrong with our churches? 
And I'm very fearful our churches are full of lost people. They know, they know about God, but they don't know God. And, and there is a huge difference, and there'll never be any power of God in a church as long as the majority of the people exist that way. Remember, after some time, and they get to go on, and they go over into the land of Egypt, and then they get defeated, uh, and they begin to marry wives again in and of the people, and he said, you're a mixed multitude. And he said, you're going to have to separate out. And they, they did exactly that. But I want you to see at this time, I don't believe Moses knew God at all. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert. Now I want you to notice two things. First of all, that he was very satisfied in his job. He uh, was looking for uh, grass for these cows to eat. Now, I also want you to notice it said to the backside of the desert. Now, there's one or two play, there's one or two ways to get to the backside of the desert. You either have to go through the desert or you have to go around the desert to get to the backside of the desert. And what we find in Moses' life spiritually, he's going through a real, real dry time. And every one of us as modern day believers, you will go through those dry, difficult times. And all I can say is look for the burning bush. Look for where God abides. Look where he continues to be and just keep going. And, and so we find him in this very isolated place. He wasn't down at the temple because there was no temple. There was no tabernacle. He was on the very backside of the desert and no one else was there. He was by himself with a bunch of cows. Now, with that thought, I want you to see it says in verse 2, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire. Now, I want you to see who initiates this, but man, don't ever forget that Moses responded. God initiated the meeting. God showed up. God revealed himself to Moses, and Moses responded. You know, I believe we live in a day where God's people are not responding anymore. They're not, they're not taking action. When God says go, they're sitting still. They're, they're not moving forward in any way. And, and so we find that uh, Moses, was, that the angel of the Lord revealed God to him in the midst of the burning bush. And it appeared to him in a flame of fire. Now, I want you to see they're in a desert and flames have kicked up. What is the problem? Now, every one of us in our, in our logical minds, if I was tending cows and the place was on fire, I'd get out, right? And I, I would preserve Jethro's cows. I would make sure that they were okay. But we find that Moses did not do that. He made a spiritual decision. You know what we need to do in the modern days? Make spiritual decisions. We, we don't need to look at the, at, at the qualm around us and go by what the world would do, but rather we need to respond to God and do what the Lord God would have us to do. And, and so we find what could have been disastrous, Moses stuck with. Verse 3, And Moses says, I will now turn aside and see this great sight while the bush is not is not burned. Now I want you to see that, that this bush is on fire, but it's not consumed. The three Hebrew children went into the fire, but they were not consumed. Uh, see, the fire is coming, but we're not consumed. Uh, don't fret yourself. Don't worry. In fact, in the midst of the fire, you can see God. And that's exactly what was occurring here. And, and we get all dis, disheveled and, or disheveled and upset. But I want you to see that Moses did not. He actually turned toward the fire. He got closer to it. When, when in man's ideas, he would have been running and, and getting away from it. He actually went toward the fire. Verse 4. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see... God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. 
Now that's the effectual call of God. Now when the Lord saved me, I did not hear the voice, Larry, Larry, but listen, he spoke to me just as much in real terms. He spoke to my heart, and I've never been the same again. See, Moses from this moment was destined to follow the will of God. And, and if you're saved, once he saves you, he calls you, you're destined to follow the will of God. And, and he did even to the get uh, what would have been the giving of his own life. The Lord took him. But I want you to see that uh, this is not, you're not in this for the short term. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're not in here for the quick haul. You're in to the end. And whether he takes us and takes us home or whether you're put, pushing up daisies, me and Jarrett was standing there uh, by the window during break and picking out my gravesite. And uh, uh, if I make it out there one day, you know what? That's how, that's how I'll end up, right? <clears throat> Mo, the Bible says Moses buried, I mean, God buried Moses, so uh, that's the way to do it. And, and, and so I want you to see whatever experience you have should have the power to commit you for life. Amen. And if it doesn't, something's wrong. You didn't run well. Who did bewitch you? Mm -hmm. You see? And, and so, we, uh, so we see that Moses has something ha that, that we need to liken to today where God calls us and gives us this zeal that lasts the entirety of his life, of our lives. Verse 5. And he, meaning God, said, Draw not Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Now, I want you to think back in your time in your mind's eye to when the Lord saved you, and I bet, unfortunately for me, and unfortunately for you, you could count on your hand, one hand, the times you've stood on holy ground. Now, that means that God's with you and you're with God. Now, the God with you, uh, he said he'd never leave us nor forsake us. So how do we get where, where we're not on the holy ground? We leave him. We, we go the other way. And you know what? It's not a difficult, I mean, it is not an easy thing to stand on holy ground. Because, see, there's opposition on every hand, and the opposition awful, often comes from the people you love best. But stand on holy ground. Remain right where you're at. And, and I want you to see, he was told to kick his shoes off, and, and I've never quite understood that. I'm assuming it's a, an act of reverence and, and being near unto the person of God, but I want you to see that Whatever the situation, he went after it. Now notice what it says. And this is why I believe this was his instant of salvation, verse 6. More he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Now I want you to see a number of things here. First of all, he introduces himself to Moses. Now, if Moses was a saved man, that wouldn't have been necessary. If he already knew God, mm. why would have God had to introduce himself? And then secondly, I want you to see that he, he introduces himself and says, this is, this is who I am. This is my nature. This is who I, who I present. And I want you to see that for his very first time, Moses feared to look on God. See, that's the natural response when you come unto God's holiness is you know how ungodly you really are and you don't want to look upon God. You know how we can look upon God today on the merit of Christ. And that is the only way. And, and so we find that, that Moses has this unbelievable experience coming into the nearness of God. Now, you know the rest of the testimony of Moses' life. It got to the point 
uh, at, the, at the end, you know, he said, I just want to see you so bad. In fact, he says, uh, no man can see God and live. That was his answer to Moses. And you know what? Moses was okay with that. He's ready to go. He would have enjoyed getting his life to see God. And he finally said, well, you can see my hinder parts. See, that's a long way from hiding your face from God, isn't it? And you think about that was 40-year journey. You know, this should get better and better down here, not worse and worse. Now, is the situation out here going to get worse? You bet you. But the situation between me and God will get better. I, I've been saved 40 years now. And it should be better now than it was then. And, and that's how he wants it for his own, his own children. And so I want you to see that, that Moses had this wonderful experience and immediately God gives Moses the plan, God's plan for Moses' life. And it is, you know, it's always contrary to what we want, is it not? You know what this flesh wants? Money and things. Mm -hmm. That's what we want. And God's plan is always contrary to that. What did he say? With food and raiment, be there with content. He didn't even say you need a roof over your head. He said you got something to put on and you got something to eat, you're in good shape carnally. But we want houses, we want lands. Remember the rich young ruler? He came to him and said, sell all thou hast and come follow me. He said that he went away uh, grieving because he knew where his love was at. And so we find that Moses on this occasion, what really happened, he fell in love with the person of God. See, true love will make you do crazy things. True love will make you go after them 110%. And that's what happened here is God, Moses became, God came, became Moses as just all-encompassing being. That's because God revealed himself. Isn't it a wonderful thing when God comes down now in the church age to the person of the Holy Ghost and reveals himself? Now, uh, a lot of Baptists don't want to talk about it, and it's like a taboo thing. I know it ain't to y'all because I say it enough, but you know what? If you're going to experience God here on this earth, it's got to be through the Holy Ghost. You won't experience him any other way because those other persons are not here right now. Now, I understand they're all one and the same, but at the same time, who's his expression here where we live now? It's the Holy Ghost. And, and, and so we find then, as, uh, as Moses uh, has this experience, immediately the Lord God puts him to work, and immediately Moses has, I can't, I can't, I can't. You ever, uh, you ever had one of those I can't situations? I have. I ain't gonna do that. The other day, a uh, very interesting thing, and since I went back to home health, I'm drawing a lot of blood again. And I was pretty much in the office for six years at the nursing home, and five years. And I got rusty, and uh-oh. Uh and so, and you know, my hands shake ever since my brain surgery. I thought, well, I'm gonna, I, I won't be one stick anymore. And so I went to this gentleman's house and the other nurse had forgot something, I was in orientation. And I said, we gotta draw your blood today. And so I poked him and got the blood, first stick. And I've I, I missed twice since then, so don't be impressed. But, uh, what, what I'm saying, when you learn something, you usually don't forget it. You can be useful for God anytime, anywhere, when we speak his name. And so we find that Moses immediately, like a good sound Baptist, has this wonderful experience with God, and God identifies himself to him, and then immediately the I can'ts begin. That is the natural state of man. Don't let it get in your way. Don't let it become a, di a, a difficult thing for you. First Samuel, 
uh, 1 Samuel chapter 3. We look at the calling of Samuel. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 3 in the first verse. 1 Samuel chapter 3 in the first verse the Bible says and the child Samuel. Now I want you to I want to point out uh, that this age of accountability that people teach and preach is a farce. It is not true. You know when you're accountable of sin the day you're born. And you know why? Because that's your, that's your nature. Now what happens to babies when they die? I don't know. I know this, that David said concerning his infant son, <laughs> he can't come to me, but I can go to him. So, but that's not our subject. I want you to see the nature of man is sinful and that Samuel was a child. And I'm assuming, uh, Naomi, I mean, excuse me, Hannah had left him there all his life. And when he was three, she offered a sacrifice for him. So sometime after that and before now, I'm assuming a seven, a seven eight year old child, he meets God. So don't ever think you're too young or too old to meet God. Because the instance I just read of of Moses, how old was he? Eighty. And we find this little boy here that has a very, very similar experience with God. See, God is still in the saving business, is he not? I fully believe that. You know what? I think if the Lord didn't have some elect left to save, we'd be out of here. So I just have to depend the gospel's still working, right? And, and so we find that this little boy, Samuel, is doing what he can to minister at the temple. Now, I want you to see this is years later after the redemption of Moses. The law has been in place. The temple now exists. And they're doing, they're doing their religious works. And we find Samuel right in the middle of it. You know, you know where your children lost, saved, or anywhere? Uh, where they need to be is at the house of God. Yeah. Hannah took Samuel down there and left him all his life. That's a good place to be, is it not? You know what? I don't care how ungodly uh, my children may get. On Sunday morning, they're going to be down at the house of God. And on Wednesday night, wherever we get together, whenever we get together. Because you know what? I believe that's what the Bible says. You know what's going to happen if they're going to hear the gospel? It's going to be right here. So I want them here. And in fact, I'll go further than that. They're going to be here. And, and, and so we find that that was Samuel's job and he was down at the temple and he was where God met with his people. And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. It means he provided for his needs. He looked after Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. Listen, we're there. The Lord's word is precious. And, and I, I love this blessed old book, but it's just like Brother Jarrett was saying. You know what? Uh, you can find them about anywhere you want to. There's probably about 200 in that little room right there. And you can find the written word of God. But where do you find the preached word of God? And more than that, where do you find that the Holy Spirit mingles himself with that word and drives her home? That's what was precious in that day. And you know what? It's very precious in this day. You can go about anywhere you want to church in Dover, but where are you going to hear the Word of God? It's precious today. Uh, church has become almost like a concert. Almost like a, just a, a get-together. Mm-hmm. What does the Bible say about things like that? Through the foolishness of preaching. Mm. That's how he manifests himself. We never need to give that up for, uh, for, for a larger crowd. And, and so we find that in this ministry where the word of God is rare, that's where Samuel was being raised up. It's where our children are being raised up today. Verse 2, And it came to pass at, the time, at that time, 
when Eli was laid down in his place and his eyes began to wax dim, that's coming on all of us, that he could not see. And ere the lamp of God went out of the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down to sleep. So I have to assume if uh, Samuel, I mean, excuse me, if Eli's blind, Samuel's tending to the light because it was not going out. Verse 4, uh, in church, we don't need the lamp go out. And the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, Here am I. And he ran unto Eli. Didn't understand what the Lord was wanting. And he ran unto Eli and said, Here I am, for thou callest me. And he said, I called not. Lie down again. And he went and lay down. And the Lord called yet again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for thou didst call me. And he answered, I called not, my son, lay down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. Right. Underline that in your Bible. It's very significant. Neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. Uh, underline revealed. Because that's the reality of God. That's how you learn and the Lord called Samuel again the third time. Isn't it a wonderful thing that God, you know, you've heard these sermons years ago now. While he's calling you, you better come. He may not call you again. Well, he sure did call Samuel. You know what? He called Samuel as many times as it took, didn't he? That fourth time around, uh, Samuel answered. See, don't fret yourself about that. You just preach the gospel. And God take care of the rest of it. But you know what? With your children, just keep on preaching it. And you don't have to be a preacher like me to preach it. Just share the Word of God. Every time you get, every opportunity you get, you tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what? If they're His, He's going to hear them. Yeah. They're going to hear Him. They're going to understand and know who He is. And, and so we find that uh, the Lord God called Samuel yet again. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time, and he rose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for thou didst call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord called the child. Now, I've often thought about old Eli, why he didn't get it the first time. Well, none, there's a couple things. Number one, Eli had some bad problems in his life. Two of them was Hophni and Phinehas. Right. They, they were big problems for him. And secondly, let's go back to what our first verse said. The Word of God was precious in those days. Mm -hmm. See, it's been a long time since anybody heard from God. You ever heard a tale and forget it to someone else who's saying something about it? Like, oh yeah, I remember that, I remember that. That's kind of the situation Eli was in. It'd been so long from hearing from God, he didn't, he didn't even remember what it was like. So on that fourth, third time around, he said, oh, I know what's going on. I had not seen this or heard this or understood this in years, but I know what to do. And notice what he says. And he says, now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, uh, excuse me, verse 8. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. He goes to Eli again. Verse 9, therefore Eli said unto Samuel, go lie down, and it shall be if he call thee that thou shalt say, speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and lay down in his place, and the word came, <laughs> and the Lord came and stood. And called as and called as at other times. Now I want you to see one more thing and we're gonna move on. What's different this time? It said the Lord came and he stood. You know, the only way that I can come to that is that uh, old Samuel knew he was there. See we need experiences like that for our people, our young people, that they are certain that they know who God is. Yeah. That's why I fully believe, he says, make your calling and election sure. Listen, I, I want some, something a lot more than a little prayer to take me into eternity, don't you? Yeah. 
computer. I, I want something I can depend on. And so we find that once again, God manifested himself and the result was a changed life. So much changed was he that he could stand in the face of Saul the king and set his head and shoulders above everybody else, big muscular man, and say, you're not going to be king no more. You know what that takes? That takes the power of God. You don't say that to somebody that's twice your size on your own merit. You go on the merit of God. And, and so we find that's exactly what occurs. He's used greatly of the Lord because the Lord had, had called him and, he, and the person of who God is was revealed to him. Now, I want you to uh, go with me very quickly to the Gospel of Matthew, uh, verse, uh, excuse me, chapter 16, uh, verse 15. I read this in your hearing a uh, hundred times over the years, but I want to read it just slightly, and then we're going to go somewhere else. Uh, Matthew 16, verse 15. Bible says, the Lord Jesus speaking, and he saith unto them, meaning his apostles, but whom say ye that I am? That's a very pressing question, don't you think? Who do you say God is? What do you say that he's able to do? What do you say his character is? You know, I think fully one of the biggest things that's been let go in, in the day in which we live is the understanding of God's holiness. It's just like Brother Jarrett was teaching. You, you know, they brought him down to nothing more than we are. He's a holy God. So he says, who's people saying that I am? And, Jesus, and, and Peter responds to the Lord Jesus in verse 16. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so we find very, very similar experience that Christ must be revealed. And, and you know what? There was many, many times after this that old Peter fell flat on his face and wasn't, and wasn't where he needed to be with God. And sometimes we turn like he was a Jew again and there was something different between the Jews and the Gentiles. He denied he even knew the Lord Jesus Christ. He fell and fell and fell. But you know what? <laughs> the Bible says uh, <laughs> that... Uh, I'm trying to think, when thou art converted is what Jesus said to him. So you know what we need? Conversion, conversion is not salvation. Conversion is taking God's opinion over your own. You know what the doctrine of election is to most people? It's hateful. It's mean. But you know what it is to God's people? It's wonderful and marvelous and good. And you know why? Because we're converted people. We all, except maybe for Jared, <coughs> believed in a God that we had to invite to ourselves before, before just 20 years ago. And you know what? It wasn't that we were saved again. We were converted. We saw, hey, this is what the Bible really teaches. And that's, that's why he was saying, Peter, when you're converted, when you're changed, when you see exactly who I really am, you, you're going to be the one to lead the people. And so we find then that salvation has always been and always will be on God manifesting himself to others. The Gospel of Luke, uh, chapter 24. Luke 24 and verse 13. Luke 24 and verse 13 the Bible says, and behold, two of them, meaning of the apostles and the disciples, and behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs, and they talked together of all the things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself grew near and went <clears throat> with them 
but their eyes were holding that they should not know him. Now, this is when you should crave the revelation of God. And if you remember this story, and I'm not going to read the whole thing because y'all know it as well as me. They went all day, and the Lord Jesus was turning like he wasn't even going to go with them. And it says they, they begged him to stay with them. Mm-hmm. And then there when they got in the room, he said, oh, foolish and slow of heart, and revealed himself to them. You know, that's an amazing thing, is it not? We need that today for our young people. We need it for our old people. True salvation that sets you apart and then finding and living the will of God after he does save you. Standing on holy ground. That's where we need to be. Yeah. Just exactly where God would have us to be. And you know, just like Peter and Moses, you're going to fall flat on your face. But keep trying. Keep going. Keep standing. If you fall, get up and go in. And you'll do that on the merit of Christ. I ask you, this morning, do you even know the God I'm talking about? If not, seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Uh, Don't ever give up. Don't give up. Uh, Look unto him for salvation. And be certain you're in the will of God this morning. Uh, Get in that place where you can take your shoes off.